so this is week four. Uh, this is we're we're going to go over how to submit your story, whether it's an article, um, but mostly we're talking about books here, um, as opposed to short stories or articles for magazines and newspapers. Although it it basically it works in a very similar way. Um, so I'm sure there'll be lots of questions tonight. Uh, uh, hold off on your questions. Um, I'll take little breaks in between each each of these steps that I'm going to lay out. It's kind of like, a, I think, a, a four-step um, plan for how to get your work published. So um, hold off on the questions until or you feel free to put them in the in the chat, but I'll get to them in between the in, in between the steps. OK, so. At this point, you know, we we've gone over how to pick the case, you know, writing and editing. Um, and uh, uh, what, was the, what, what else did we talk about? We talked about writing and editing. Oh, research and interviews and um, picking the case. So at this point, you are finished. You've spent nine months to a year or longer, however long it takes to finish that book. Um, and you've given it to uh, people that you know and trust to read, to give you some notes, you've done a self-edit, and now you feel it's in pretty good shape. So um, at this point, very important, before you do anything else, you need to celebrate a little bit. So, um, you know, get a nice bottle of wine, uh, you know, pop some champagne, smoke a stogie, uh, take a little trip, but go somewhere and, and celebrate, because at that point, you've accomplished something that most people never accomplish in their lives. And a lot of people think about writing a book at some point, but um, very few can get across that finish line. So that's a major accomplishment in itself. So take some time and um, and celebrate. And that also gives you time to just step away from it for a week or two and just let it, let it marinate, let it sit there. Um, my, uh, my best advice at this point um, after you finished writing is something that my first uh, book editor told me um, when I when he um, agreed to publish my first book, and that's plan to be poor a little while longer. Um, because at this point, everything is going to be super slow. Once you you're, you're going to spend a few months getting an agent, probably, and then um, you're hopefully going to be lucky enough to sell the work. Um, at that point, the process really begins, and it's a slog because uh, from the time that you turn your manuscript into the editor till the time that that book is on bookshelves is somewhere between 18 months, which is super fast in the publishing world, to two years. So, it may, and sometimes it's longer based on how big the publisher is and, and where they're going to fit your work in with their other titles. So you're going to be waiting and, uh, and staying out of trouble and, uh, and, and just being there for, for the process. Um, and why does it take that long? Here's some of the things that happen in those 18 months to two years. Um, there's a legal review, especially if you're writing about true crime where a lawyer is going to read through the whole manuscript and then come to you with uh, exhaustive notes on how um, not to get anybody sued. And um, you have to work with them on an edit. Then once you've got it kind of worked out, um, it goes, of course, to there's a copy, copy editor that gets involved. Um, but then there's a layout and they have to pick a, a, a specific layout for the book and the look for the book. And there's conversations with you, although at this point, um, you're allowed, you, you have some input, but it's mostly under their control at this point, and, and should be, um, you know, because what, you know, what do I know about layout or, or art or um, any of that? I'm sure some of you may have, you know, maybe, maybe some of you are artists as well and, and had, or, you know, no layout. That would be a little different, but um, part of this is trusting them to do their job and everybody at this point is a professional and um, you should you should put trust in them. So, um, you know, and then uh, you, here's an exciting step um, is about six months before publication, you'll get advanced copies. And um, the reason they have to have that six months in advance is because 
uh, you want reviews in, you know, still the, the reviews that make or break a book are New York Times, New Yorker, um, Washington Post. Uh, but before those reviews also are um, trade journal reviews. So the library journal and publishers uh, weekly is a big one. Um, Kirkus and um, those come in early. So you have to have those advanced copies six months in advance so you can send those to the reviewers and they have enough time to read and digest. They're very slow to get and they have piles of books waiting to be reviewed. So the first reviews come through the trade magazines and that's, like I said, Kirkus, Publishers Weekly and Library Journal. And those reviews, what you're hoping for are stars. Um, so you're hoping to get a starred review from Library Journal or a starred review from Publishers Weekly. And that's the first like trigger where bookstores and booksellers will, will start to take notice because they'll just, it's very easy for them to scan through the, the trade journal reviews and just pick out those starred reviews. They know that this is a quality book based on you know, the, their subjective opinion, but they read so many books, these, these reviewers, that they can pick out quality stuff. So you're hoping for a star, but if you don't get a star, it's not the end of the world. Um, then, then come the media reviewers and um, you'll have the traditional media like, uh, you know, the Times. Um, everybody wants that. And it does. I mean, it, they make books. And uh, uh, but more and more social media influencers. Also, you're giving them advanced copies. So hopefully they fall in love with it and write some of the first reviews. Um, one of the things I'm doing with my latest book that comes out in June is I went back to um, Goodreads and we went to the uh, reviews of True Crime Attic, my last true crime book. And we found like the top 10 most enthusiastic reviews that had the most likes. And um, we sent them copies. We said, hey, if you like True Crime Attic, you might like this one. And so they'll be able to start posting those early reviews on Goodreads because they're reading it before uh, the general public. So people will go on to Goodreads and, and, and they're like, what's this book about? Is it any good? And you're loaded up with some some good reviews at first. So things like that. But we'll get more into that next week with marketing. Um, so that kind of gives you the idea of the time frame there. Um, so I, I can hear some of you probably thinking, if it takes this long, you know, why don't I just self-publish? And the, the main reason I, I, I would not want you to self-publish, and everybody's free to do what they want, of course, but... Um, you won't make money. You know, you, you just, you, you won't. Um, I, I, I think the people that have made money self-publishing are, you know, one in a million. Um, and typically they make just enough until they, you know, a traditional publisher takes note and then they switch over to traditional publishing anyway. So um, I would suggest avoiding, avoiding that at, at all costs. Um, so uh You'll also, you know, another, I, I've, I've spoken to a lot of aspiring writers who, who can't wait that they don't have patience and they're like, I'm just going to self-publish and I'll always ask them why. And they're like, well, you know, it's just for me, which is fine. Or sometimes they'll say, well, I, you know, I want to share this with people. I want to share it with readers. I can't wait that long. If you can just be patient and, and go through the process, um, I guarantee you that the number of people that will read your book will be a hundred times whatever you can do with self-publishing. Um, so traditional publishing in, in, you know, in, in my view is still the right way to go. Um, uh, I will say this. Um, the good news is that I strongly believe if your writing is, is just serviceable, you know, you don't have to be a great writer. Um, if you're a decent writer, you will sell that book. If you if you take the time and you go through these steps um, that I'm about to lay out, I'm 100% convinced if you put the time and effort into it, you will sell that book. If If it's simply adequate, meaning you've got grammar down, you've got story structure, it has some sort of... Um, story to it, you know, with the beginning, middle, and, and end, um, because the vast majority of submissions that agents are getting 
are, um, you know, you'd be surprised at the the lack of simple understanding of basic grammar rules and uh, story structure. So you just need to be serviceable. And remember, writing. Um, I don't even I don't consider writing itself to be an art. Um, in fact, writing in journalism, true crime writing specifically, is considered a trade, like carpentry. And they consider it a trade because if you follow simple steps, anybody can do it. Um, you know, the simple steps of arranging a paragraph, understanding story, understanding grammar, the language of, of writing. Um, if you can do that, um, that's that's why anybody anybody could 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 do this if they if they have the patience. Um, now the art comes in when, just like in carpentry, you know, you anybody could be a carpenter. You can learn to pound nails and get it right. Um, the artistry, of course, comes in 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 the subtlety and um, you know how you're pounding those nails in and and how you're laying out the you know, the structure of a house and, and how ornate it is. Does it have crown molding? Does it have, you know, all these, these nice little accoutrements and, um, you know, fun little things. And I'm picturing a Victorian house as, as composed to like a cookie cutter box house. So, you know, you can write that story. Um, there's, and then, and then fiddle with the, the art of it at the end. Uh, but first, uh, you need an agent. You know, that's this is step one: finding an appropriate agent. The because the agent will submit it to the editor. The editor is the one that buys it for the publisher that they work for or the imprint that they have. Um, so that's that's the way it works in traditional publishing. Uh, step one: finding an appropriate agent. Big thing at the top here is. Um, a legitimate agent will never, ever ask you for money. Uh, that goes for editors or publishers too, by the way. Um, agents work for you. They make money when they sell your work and they, they, they get a 15% cut of, um, of your advance or your earnings on that book that they sold forever. So um, that is their motivation is that 15%. If an agent or a publisher is asking you for money, uh, end the conversation there and walk away knowing you did the right thing. Um, these agents, now why can the agent sell your work? Why can't you just sell it directly to an editor or a publisher? Because um, the agents are the ones that have these contacts. It's in, in publishing, just like in you know a lot of places, it's, it's, it is who you know and, and what that what their reputation is and, and how big their Rolodex is. Um, and uh, they, they, they meet with these editors on a regular basis to find out things like, what is that editor looking for this year? You know, an editor might decide, okay, this year I'm looking for, you know, fantasy involving, you know, minotaurs or, you know, they're very specific like that sometimes, or like, just romance novels featuring pirates and you know so they they know what the editors are looking for so nobody's wasting anybody else's time um some people have submitted directly to editors but uh again um the success stories are if you're you know if 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 you're a gambler you know you're not going to put your work you're not going to put your money on you know, one in a hundred odds. It's just not worth not worth your time. And a lot of editors, when they're approached by authors, will just pitch. There, you need to be solicited. You need you need it needs to come from somebody that they know. Um, so, in a way, you know, this seems uh, it did to me when I started. It seems very elitist, and it seems like there's some gatekeeping going on by these. Uh, you know, this, this class of people that mostly went to Harvard um, and, and, and Yale and the, the Ivy Leagues, and they grew up in Manhattan, and, you know, they have dinner with these people. Um, and they're the ones that's, that, that you have to convince to sell your book. 
Um, and they're the ones that say, okay, this book is worthy of my time and we're going to go off and, and try to sell it. Um, but there's, there's a good reason for that. Um, because if, if that system wasn't in place, um, the editors really couldn't do their job. The way the system is set up, editors do their, can do their thing, which is edit, you know, buying books and editing. If on top of that, they had to comb through you know, a, a slush pile of 100 manuscripts every week, they couldn't get anything else done. So, um, you know, they're, they're in, you know, again, the, for me, the biggest benefit of an agent is I don't know anybody in publishing. I'm, I'm here in Akron, Ohio. The agent knows these people. They grew up, sometimes grew up with these people. Um, sometimes they owe them a favor, you know? So, um, when you're looking for an agent, uh, I would, you're going to research them. Find first thing is find out where their office is. If their office is is within a block of Union Square in in New York City, then you know that's a good agent because they're paying the overhead for that physical office. It means they're in there at Ground Zero. They're having lunch with other editors. Editors are seeing their PO box or you know uh, address and realize that they're legit. Um, you know, they're not trying to be an agent from Pipestone, uh, Minnesota or something. Uh, so what kind of agent are you looking for? Um, as a debut author, you you should be looking, I highly recommend looking for a, not necessarily an agent with a big track record, not necessarily somebody who's been an agent for 30 years and you know knows where all the bodies are buried. Um, what I think you should be looking for is a young agent that shows a lot of promise. Um, a couple of reasons for that. The older agents that you might have heard represent some of your favorite authors um, have been in the business for decades they're not taking any clients. They don't need any more. Um, where the younger agent is still willing to take a, a risk and a gamble. And, th and, that's, and that's what we are. As debut authors, we're, um, we're a gamble. And it could be a great gamble because all they need, what the agents are looking for, are um, a handful of debut authors that become the next uh, the next big thing, even like mid tier, you know, you don't have to be the next Stephen King. They're looking for the next, um, you know, uh, whatever the <laughs> whatever the mid range authors are right now. Um, you know, just enough where everybody's everybody's making money. So um, and so you could find that big agency where there's an agent that has been doing it for thirty years, and you know these authors. Um, and look, a lot of times they'll have a website and you can go on there and find their, their new agents, you know, the young agents in that agency who are studying under this agent that you really like and are still reading new material and taking on new clients. Uh, probably your first step, if you don't know where to start, if you don't have any idea, you know, on particular agents is the writer's market. And uh, when I was submitting query letters, and that's, we'll get to that uh, on the next step. Um, I, I went to the library because the writer's market was not online at that point. And it was this like telephone book size. What's a telephone book? Uh, this telephone book <laughs> size. Um, reference book uh, that listed uh, all, all agents or most agents by the genre that they represent. So agents will usually um, specialize in a certain genre. So you'll have an agent that specializes in uh, fantasy, um, an agent that's, that specializes in horror or literary books. Um, so figure out or true crime, you know, specifically. Uh, so writer's market now has a lot of material online. And I just looked at the reason I went to the library to read through the writer's market 20 years ago is because um, 
uh, it was too expensive to buy. It was like a couple hundred dollars, I think, for the for the big bound book. Um, but now it's just uh, like I went online and their guide for agents is thirty dollars, and you can buy it. I think as a PDF online. So that's how you find some agents' contacts, and that's the easiest way. Uh, I began with agents that I found through the writer's market. And I submitted my query letter. Uh, I began submitting my query letter to them. And when I, uh, this was when I had written a book called um, The Man from Primrose Lane, which was my first published novel that came out in 2012. So I was submitting in 2010, two years before publication. And I started, I think, um, at the beginning of that year. And I, I spent like three months querying agents I did, I, you know, from the writer's market. And I started to get back uh, rejection letters. And at first they were just form letters. And I, it's important to keep those, by the way, because hopefully one day you'll be able to pull them out and say, oh, this guy passed on me. But, you know, now I'm, you know, now I'm, I've got this career. And it should motivate you, these rejections, not, not, not kill you. Um, because it's, it's very subjective. A lot of times you just get the rejection because they can't take on more clients or they don't represent exactly that type of book. Um, or they read the first you know, couple uh, paragraphs and they just don't click with your writing. Doesn't mean your writing's bad. Just means that they have some specific thing they're looking for. So try not to take it personally. Um, so I started getting nibbles from some agents and a couple of them asked for some writing, you know, the first 50 pages. And, uh, but, you know, they were, they were hard to, um, you know, not many of them followed up after that. So after submitting, I think, 18 to 20 queries, uh, I, I thought, well, maybe there's a, another way to do this. And so what I did next was I went to um, Barnes and Noble and I looked for books that were similar to mine. And The Man from Primrose Lane is a novel. It's, a, it's fiction, it's um, thriller, but with a hint of sci-fi. So it mixes genre in a very um, uh, rare type of way. There's not too many people that are doing that. And so I, I, I tracked them down and then I took their book and in the acknowledgement section of the books, they usually thank their agent. So I'd write down their agent's name because I know they already like the type of writing that I'm doing. Um, you can also find if you have a particular author that you think is similar to what you do, um, you can also Google them. It's pretty easy to find somebody's agent these days because some of them just put it on twitter they're like represented by and you get the twitter twitter handle and can find them that way um or their website their personal website sometimes the agents list their the authors they represent so you can find you can find them that way uh and i started so i started submitting to agents not from the writer's market but through my own research and that's when i really started to get uh, some decent letters back. And even the rejections would be like, hey, you know, I really dig what you're doing, but it, I just can't take on somebody else or the timing's not right for this, or I didn't like this one thing and I don't know if you would even want to fix it. So um, it started and they'd start to ask for more and more writing. So I knew I was getting, getting close. And um, there's another thing that plays a part in this, just like any any other business is is timing and in the world of agents uh sometimes you can use that timing to your advantage and here's how you look for the big trade fairs in publishing industry so there's a big trade fair that happens in berlin every year there's a big one that happens in london a couple months before those fairs newer agents are loading up to take new books with them, especially debut author books, with them to these fairs to meet with editors and start, you know, hand, handing them a physical copy. They'll do like sometimes a mock-up of the book 
so that they have something to take back to their hotel room, these editors, and uh, and read while they're there. And it's just like, in some ways, Sundance Film Festival, where you present uh, a book instead of a movie, at, like you would at Sundance, and gets everybody excited. And and one 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 editor will think, well, I got to buy this before, you know, uh, Joanne down the the uh, the hallway, you know, gets it. So you can kind of play them off of each other that way. So timing could be a key of it, a key for it too. And I would recommend trying to submit three months before some of those big fairs. It can't hurt. Uh, like I said, I started having better luck soliciting to agents the rope uh, that represented work like mine. Um, so let me tell you the story about how I did end up getting uh, my first agent. So in um, in Cleveland, we had a, I, I attended this um, showcase for local authors and I, I was invited uh, as a as a guest because I'd written uh, the book on the Amy Mihalovic case, which was published just locally here. And so I went and there was an, another writer from Shaker Heights from Cleveland there. Her name was Paula McLean. Uh, you might know her as the author of a book called The Paris Wife, if you've read that. Um, but Paula's from Northeast Ohio and she was there with her book. And uh, we were going, uh, my wife, Julie was there and we would walk around just looking at everybody's books to buy a couple. And Julie stopped at Paula McLean's table and met her and she seemed really nice. And uh, Julie was just kind of glancing through the book, reading a couple passages. And she said, hey, this writing, it feels a lot like what you're doing. And I thought, well, let's try her agent. So a couple of days after that, I sent Paula McLean's agent, a woman also named Julie, Julie Bearer. And I sent Paula McLean's agent a query letter and uh, said, hey, I just met your, I just met your author, uh, Paula, at this event. Um, I'm reading her book right now. I really like it. And uh, I thought maybe you'd be a good fit for what I'm doing. And that personal connection, I think, is what did it. Because Julie got back to me right away. And she said, send me, send me your manuscript. And I sent it over. I think it was a Friday. And then on, I think on Monday, she called and said, this is, you know, I want to represent this. So um, that's how I ended up getting my first agent, Julie Bearer. Um, you know, work near uh, Union Square uh, in New York. Um, she eventually, I wondered early on how I ended up getting a review from Colson Whitehead. Um, and it's because I, I didn't know at the time, but um, they were courting. And uh, now Julie is married to Colson um, and they, they have a lovely family out on Long Island. So um, Julie took the manuscript for the man from Primrose Lane to I think it was right before Berlin, um, but eventually sent it to, I think, a dozen editors. And when your agent sends it to editors, they'll give them a time frame and say, hey, you know, here's what the book's about. Here's why I think you'd like it. Uh, we need your response in two weeks. If, if you like it, great. If you don't, fine. Um, but we need a response in two weeks. And so that starts a ticking clock. And then what you're hoping for is more than one editor comes back and says, hey, I'm interested in this. And luckily with Primrose, that, that happened. There were three editors that were interested in buying it. And so at that point, um, you will, well, I'll get, to, I'll get to the editor stuff here uh, a little bit more, but um, there was a little bit of a of an auction, and that's what you're hoping for. Is there's an auction where the editors bid against each other, and send in their top bid, and then you pick the editor you like. Um, I my book was uh, published by Sarah Crichton Books, which is an imprint run by Sarah Crichton at uh, uh, Farrar Strauss and Giroux, which is one of the major publishers in New York. Um, and uh, Sarah is, and you'll see this a lot at that level, um, you'll see legacies, you know, people that who's, who grew up in the business, whose parents were in the business. Sarah's father um, was uh, the novelist 
uh, not Michael Crichton, uh, the novelist Robert Crichton, who was very popular, I believe, in the 50s and 60s, wrote a book called Secret of Santa Vittoria. Um, so she grew up in the business and kn knows everybody. I think she's running um, uh, she's running a different publishing um, company right now. Uh, so later on, um, once the process got rolling, I went out to New York City and I met with Sarah and we went out for lunch. And during that lunch, I asked her, I said, why did you buy my book? And she told, she told me this story um, about how a couple of years before, a book had come, uh, a book had come, a manuscript had come across her desk that reminded her a lot of my book. She said the the writing was very similar uh, in in her mind, um, and she thought about buying that book and passed on it. And that book was uh, the girl with the dragon tattoo, and so she got she kind of got burned by passing up on that book. And I said, well, why'd you pass up on that? And she said, oh, you know, the, the, the writing was serviceable. It wasn't, the writing wasn't great. The story was great. The writing, not so much. And so, you know, the fact that I reminded her of, of him was kind of always a, a backwards compliment, I, I think, a backhand compliment. Um, but that's, you know, that, you know, there are these weird things that you'll never guess, you know, why an editor will um, not like your manuscript or what, why an editor will really want your manuscript. Uh, so the biggest thing to remember with an agent is an agent should, your relationship with the agent should feel in some ways like a, like a marriage. Uh, it's, it shouldn't feel just transactional. Um, this agent you're going to go through rough times. You're going to have criticism, and you should have an agent that always has your back, uh, that's supportive of what you want to do. And you might want to have a conversation about what you want to do long term, because maybe you don't want to just write true crime, or you don't just want to write science fiction. You want to try a couple different things, and some agents will not like that because it's hard to market that type of writer. Um so, uh, you know, take the time to, to make friends with these people. Um, yeah, so um, that is step one, you know, how to, how to kind of think about picking an, an agent. We're going to go on to step two, um, how to write a query letter. But are there any questions at this point? Feel free to unmute or, or you know, type a question in the chat. Raise a hand. Uh, Emily has a question. Is the 15% you mentioned for the agents cut an industry standard and can it vary by agent? That's an industry standard. If if they're asking for, for more, they're, they're not legit um, either. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to keep going. Um, so step two, the query letter. This is uh, your this this is super important. It could be the most important part of the whole process. You have to have a good query letter. This is the letter that you're going to send to the agent saying, "I would like you to represent me." Um, and there's an excellent, simple query letter in Stephen King's on writing. I would recommend um, checking that out because it worked for him and why reinvent the wheel, right? The most important thing about the query letter is it should only be a page, should only be a page long. A lot of these will happen in uh, email these days. So, you know, you're looking at maybe four or five paragraphs. Um, let me show you. I went back through my old Hotmail account to find the queries that I sent out for Primrose Lane. And so let me show you what that looks like. Here we go. First query. These are the this is the query that was rejected uh, over and over. Um, but it's very similar. If you've read on writing, it's very similar to Stephen King's because they use that as a template. Um, I, I I think I found this agent through uh, the writer's market. I'm a young author in search of an agent. I've just comp and that could be important. It it doesn't matter if you're if you're young, but you know 
it, it seemed like a decent way to begin it. I've just completed a um, uh, 140,000 word mystery novel, which now that, that seems very long, uh, that blends hard-boiled crime with a hint of sci-fi. It has been edited and vetted and seems to appeal to a wide range of readers. Um, so second paragraph should be, you know, here's why I'm reaching out to you. Here's what I have to offer. Third paragraph should be kind of a quick little biography about why um, why they should think that you're decent enough to write a book in the first place. So I, I gave her some um, some of my history, which were, were these regional books and some of these awards that I'd won for journalism. Um, and then this is this was kind of a ballsy move. Uh, I don't know that I'd do it if I had it to do over again. Um, but I went ahead and I attached a, my prologue and the first two chapters of my book. A lot of times they don't want you to do that. Uh, and in your query letter, you could just kind of do, you know, two or three sentences real quick about what that book is about and ask them if, if they would consider reading the first 50 pages if you want. Um, and then, you know, thank them for their time. So that was the one that was rejected. I'll show you the one I sent to Julie Bearer, the one that was accepted. It's very similar. Um, so I start off this time explaining to her the connection to Paula McLean. So right off the bat, she's like, oh, okay, he knows another person I represent. Um, that alone set me apart from the crowd. And so she actually took the time to read the rest. And uh, what I didn't know at the time, which Julie certainly knew, and Paula did probably too, is, um, hold on, let me turn off sharing. Okay, stop sharing. <clears throat> is that Paula McLean's book, The Paris Wife, was going to be huge. You know, they the publisher had already realized there was going to be a lot of um, a lot of people that were going to be reading that book. And uh, so they knew they had kind of a hit on their hands and so did the, the editors in the publishing industry. So when Julie Bear reached out to them, they're like, oh my gosh, she, you know, the Paris wife is going to be huge in a couple months. So we better look at what she's submitting. So the, it was all about timing with that one too. And, and, but it was stuff that I had no control over and didn't know anything about until months later. <clears throat> um, any questions at this point before we go to step three? All right, we'll keep rolling. Um, step three, picking the right editor. So um, you've got your agent now and they've submitted it to editors and the editors are calling back saying, hey, you know, we want to we want to buy your book. Um, real quick, let me let me answer Alexis Alexis's uh, question. Um, if this is your first book, how do you make yourself more appealing to the agent? Uh, there's not much that you have to do. Again, um, have a complete manuscript that's that's serviceable. Have their you know uh, a, a good story structure. Um, the re what makes you appealing to them is the very fact that you are a debut author, because um, at, at that point you're unproven and it's, it's actually working in your favor because you could be the next hit. They don't exactly know. Um, nobody in the business, agents or editors, really, <laughs> really understand what books are going to be a hit and what aren't until a couple months before the release when they start noticing, you know, how it's, how they're buying up uh, from bookstores. Um, you know, you look at somebody like Stephanie Meyer, who wrote Twilight. Um, you know, if you're a fan of that book, great. You know, the, the story I think is fine, but the writing, the writing is atrocious. And so many editors passed up on that book because it wasn't, it was almost not serviceable. So um, you just never know what's going to be a big hit. And as a debut author, you might be it. And they're going to gamble on that because, um, um, you know, because the, it might be a big payout for them. 
Um, I'm jumping a little ahead on this question, but it's an interesting question um, and tells you a lot about the business. But there are some agents that uh, kind of specialize in debut authors, and they will um, go and, and represent, say, 10 debut authors and get them really big advances. Uh, and because they know that one, you know, if just one out of those 10 become a hit, then they've got a writer that they're going to work with for decades that's going to make them money. The other nine authors, they're never going to have another book. But we'll get to that. We'll get to more about the advance here in, in, in a couple minutes. Right now, let's jump back over to... Um, oh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Let me go back and, and answer Jamar's question. What if you don't have previously published content or accolades? What if all you have is this book? Um, that's fine. You know, you still, you know, you're still telling them I have a completed manuscript. I have completed a book. I've finished this. Uh, and um, I, I don't think it matters all that much. You might want to put into the query more about if you don't have any of those things, why you're doing this now, why this book is important to you, why, why you chose to do this, you know, maybe, and, you know, sometimes that makes a sexy story, you know, because one of my favorite writers is this guy, Donald Ray Pollock. He didn't have any accolades. He worked at a, um, um, a mill in Knockamstiff, Ohio for 30 years, just grinding out this nine to five factory job and he wrote this book in his spare time and he submitted it to publishers and he's like, I don't know if this is any good, um, but I wrote this when I wasn't working at the factory and somebody took the time to read it and it was fantastic. And the fact that he's this factory worker with no background actually became the story and got articles written about him in major publications because he was kind of an exotic that way. So um, it's not necessarily bad. Uh, does being self-published in the past help or hurt you getting into traditional publishing? I will tell you this, it probably does hurt a little bit if you've self-published. So um, before you submit to traditional agents and publishers, consider, you know, if, if you have self-published books out there that are just sitting there that aren't generating any new copies or readers maybe you take those down you know and tell yourself well i'm going to take these down for six months and see if i can get an agent um because it it, it legitimately it might hurt a little bit um okay so picking the right editor you have to pick an editor now hopefully hopefully more than one editor has come back and said they like your stuff and uh so you're going to have a, a couple agents saying, I want to buy your book. Now, um, you need to research those editors and find out who are the authors they've worked with before. Um, do you know any of their books? Those are the first questions. Then you'll have a conversation over the phone, um, a one-on-one -on -one between you and the editor. They'll call you up. There are a couple important questions you need to ask during that phone call. Um, and part of that phone call, you're, you're just having small talk. You're just getting to know them. Tell them about your family. Tell them about what you do, where you grew up. Um, ask them about, you know, about themselves, where they're from, how they got into publishing. Have some small talk first. Um, but there are some important questions. You need to ask them what their vision is for your work. Um, maybe they want to buy it, but maybe they're also in the back of their mind thinking, you know, we're going to have to like this whole half, the, the whole second half of the book is just not working. They'll have to rewrite that. Um, and you have to ask yourself, do you really like that last half of the book? Are you willing to completely change it for them? Or maybe there's another editor that also wants the book who thinks it's great. That second half is great. And they, there's just some small tweaks to be made. So um, ask them what, what their vision is, what they plan to do with the book, how much editing is going to be involved do they think when they expect to publish because they'll have their calendar and they'll know where their windows are where they they can publish you so um you know you ask them when they plan to publish if they come back and say well 
that's a good question. I guess my next window isn't for three years. You know, maybe the maybe the next editor will say, "Oh, we we we're going to fast track this. We'll get this out in eighteen months." So that's another eighteen months of a career that you'll have. So um, look at that. Uh, also important to remember to ask them how they'll market it. And we'll, we'll you know next week we're talking all about marketing um, and um, getting the the word out about your book. But but they need to support it a little bit too. They're not going to do much, but Ask them what they can do to help market it. Um, now, so you've got, let's say, three editors on the hook, and they all come to you with numbers. And they'll say, this is how much we're willing to pay for this book. It's You don't necessarily want to go with the top number just because it's more money. Um, look at those other questions, how they answer those other questions. But also keep this in mind. Um, and, and this is something I, I, I almost learned the hard way. A big advance is not necessarily a good thing. And here's why. Um, I'll tell you my numbers. So um, my deal with Sarah Crichton books was uh, for two books. Over that conversation I had on the phone, she said, okay, I like Primrose Lane, but what do you have next? And I, and I told her the idea I had for my second novel, uh, which came to be called The Great Forgetting. And she really liked the idea. And she said, well, I want that too. So she came back and said, here's, here's money for a two book deal, which was great. I'm like, oh my God, um, you know, not, not only am I selling this book, but they're selling, I'm selling the second book sight unseen. She hasn't even read it. So that sounded great and came back with a large number. Um, it was uh, it, it very <laughs> uh, low six figures um, for the advance. And as somebody that made up to that point, probably I was averaging twenty five to thirty thousand dollars a year, um, everything from waiting tables to, to to writing stories for the alt weeklies out here. That was a, that was a lot of money. That was life changing money. Um, and so um, I went with it. But here's the problem with the advance. Uh, big advances is it is an advance. You have to remember that it is, <laughs> you know, it is an advance. They're not just handing you this money. That is an advance on earnings, meaning that they expect you to sell enough books to earn back that money. And when you go with six figure advances or even high five figure advances, it's very difficult actually to earn that back. Um, the, uh, most books don't sell more than 5,000 copies. Uh, any book that sells more than 5,000 copies is considered a success. Now, figure in you're making about $2.50 per copy per book and multiply that by 5,000. It's not going to get you to earning out that advance. And in fact, I never earned out the advance for uh, Primrose Lane and The Great Forgetting. Why is that important? Worst case scenario, you have a terrible relationship with, you develop a terrible relationship with uh, the editor and publisher in this mix somehow, and they can ask for that money back, um, which hardly ever happens, hardly ever happens. It sounds scary. Um, it shouldn't be because I've only heard of that happening once or twice. And that was like when the writer just burned down bridges and actively tried to make their book not sell. So don't worry about that too much. Um, but when here's, here's where it becomes important because eventually you're going to hopefully want to write another book and you'll submit that to a publisher and that publisher will go on they have a computer system all these editors and agents do um, that is essentially is like a nielsen ratings for books might even actually be been be run by by nielsen but they're able to log onto the system and see approximately how many how many copies your last book sold and they'll be able to tell if you did or did not earn out your advance and if you did not earn out your advance that publisher might say, well, no, it's, you know, he's already proven he can't sell out that advance. So why would we go with him? Um, so then uh, the problem with 
high advances for debut books is if you don't hit that, your career is done there with book one. And and it will be next to impossible to ever sell another book. Um, not impossible, but it will be a, it will be a lot harder. Um, luckily, my uh, the the book after forgetting was true crime attic, true, and I took um, a small advance on that. I think the advance on true crime attic it might have been like. It might have been ten or fifteen thousand dollars, which I'm, it sounds like a lot. And I'll tell you here in a minute. While that's not quite as much as it sounds, um, but uh, we were since I took that smaller advance, I earned out the advance within like I think six months, and uh, and then you know people saw that. So my next book was a lot easier because they went back and they're like, oh well, it sold out the advance. So let's you know we can we know he's good for that amount. Let's give him maybe just a little bit more advance. So <clears throat> um, how much should you expect for an advance for a debut book? I would say typically the, the advances come in around five to $25,000. I got very lucky with the first advance, um, but typically they come between five and $25,000. Uh, I think you should be happy anywhere between five and 15,000, knowing that um, you have faith that that book is going to sell out the advance, uh, and then your next book will be much easier. So uh, I think that's that kind of that kind of covers how to deal with the editor and your advances. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the contract stuff here in a minute, which is what what comes next in this process. But any questions at this point? Yeah, I don't think Howard the Duck earned out its advance for sure. Um, although kind of a cool book in set or kind of a cool movie and set in Cleveland. Um, okay. Uh, I can answer questions at the end too. So, um, so now you have, you found your editor, you got a nice little advance. Oh, here's why the, you know, you get 10 to 15,000, you know, somewhere in there advance. Um, here's why it might not be as, as much as, as you think, um, because, the in the contract, it's going a lot of times that advance is divided into chunks. So sometimes in quarters, sometimes in thirds. So you'll get you know five thousand dollars on upon signing the contract. You'll get another five thousand um, when you uh, submit the final manuscript, and you'll get the final five thousand on publication. So it's it's they take that especially with the larger advances. They divide them into a bunch of little chunks over over the course of a year or two, and and to to get you motivated to finish the the process there. Um, this contract, when you end up with a publisher, expect it to take up to six months, maybe a little longer, uh, to uh, where the agent and the the publishing company go back and forth with you know the minutia of the contract. And uh, you're not going to be paid anything until that contract is is signed. So you've got the deal, but it's still going to, you know, it's still going to be months before you see any money. And like I said, it won't be all of it. It'll be chopped up. The money will actually come from your agent and their agency. Uh, so when the publisher pays me, the publisher pays the agency. And they take the 15% off, and then they cut me a check for the rest. And, um, you know, there's at that point, if, if you reach that point and you have questions, contact me because there's some tax issues and I, there's, there's some easy ways around that stuff. But it's, you know, that's, that's down the road. Um, but uh, so that's how your money's flowing. It's flowing through the agency. And that's legit. That's fine. Uh, make sure you read your contract. You know, I I at least, uh, you know, monitor it. I, I at least scan it. I at least kind of look at every page and um, get a sense of what they're saying here and what they're saying here, um, just so you have a, a, at least a general sense of what is in that contract. Because you might find some surprising things that you want to talk to your agent about, but the agent's typically on top of that. 
Um, one, one little thing, you know, make sure that you and your agent retain <clears throat> uh, film and TV rights uh, because you're liable to do much better negotiating. <clears throat> um, your literary agent will know uh, book to film agents in LA uh, that work at the major agencies and, and they'll get you a new agent over there to sell film and TV. And as a working writer, that's where your living money comes from. Um, your books will hopefully earn out the advances. You'll get some advances and then you'll start making royalties. But, um, you know, those royalties can be pretty small. But uh, say you get a $10,000 advance for the book, it's more likely that you'll get $25,000 um, payout for an option in, in Hollywood if a production company snatches it up. Your, Hollywood has a lot more money than the New York publishing um, world is typically gives out. Uh, and Hollywood is just throwing this money out there. Um, there's always people at production companies looking at the books that are announced in publishers marketplace. So when the deal happens with you and the agent and the editor, it's announced in publishers marketplace and they'll say, you know, Renner sold, you know, True Crime Attic to, um, you know, Macmillan for a nice sum um, to be published in 2016. And there's people in film and TV that are going through Publishers Marketplace and finding stories that they like, um, or in some cases, finding stories that their competitor likes, snatching up the rights, knowing full well they'll never make it, but they just don't want their, their competition to make it. And they'll throw you a check for $25,000. So um, there's a lot more money to be made on that side of things. Uh, but there's prestige in having the book. And you're still making a little bit there too. Uh, it, sometimes in your contract, the agent will negotiate for bonuses uh, based on how many copies you sell. So maybe you get a small advance. Say you get a $5,000 advance. Your agent could negotiate, well, if he if the book sells 25,000 copies in its first year, um, you have to pay the author a bonus of you know twenty thousand dollars. And you know it's a way of mitigating risk because they only pay that out if they've already made a bunch of money. So there's no you know harm there. Um, so that's there's typically a lot of fun bonuses at the at the end. I've never actually hit my bonuses. <laughs> So, but uh, that's a way to to generate some more money if if your book is a success. And like I said, a book is considered a success if it sells more than five thousand copies. Um, look in your contract again for what is promised as far as marketing. Um, can you get them to promise you in writing in that contract that they are going to spend a certain amount of money on advertising or they will send you to a um, convention or a conference or um, you know, see what you can get them to guarantee to do for, for marketing. Uh, but at the end, um, you know, don't sweat the contract. These contracts are boilerplate. They, they just copy and paste them from contracts that have worked for other authors for the most part, and they'll try to undercut. And then your agent's job is to ask for way too much, and then they meet in the middle where they should have started anyways. Um, everybody wants to make money. They want to make money off you and your book, and um, legit publishers will know they'll lose authors if they screw somebody over because it's such a small world, um, the word will get out. So they have no, there's nothing in it for them to screw you over. So in general, you can trust, you can trust these, these people. Um, finally, it's important to treat your agent and editor very well. Um, I recommend, like I said, tr you know, tr being friends with them, you know, f working with people that you can be friends with. Uh, I send them cards, uh, you know, holiday cards every year. Um, when I have a book that's released, I'll send them flowers. Uh, and, um, during the holidays, I send gifts to uh, all my agents. Um, you can write that off, by the way. 
Um, but uh, uh, it's important to, you know, um, keep in contact with them. And, you know, they, uh, they've come to expect uh, my treat box uh, every, every December. And, and they remember me that way. One of the many reasons. Um, so, and when you meet them in person, you're going to want to meet your agent. You're going to want to meet your editor in person. And it's worth the trip out to New York on your own dime. Um, so you can have that personal connection and let them take you out to lunch or something. Um, and, uh, but when you go, don't go empty handed, you know, it's just like, uh, you're visiting somebody at their house. You take a housewarming gift. You're meeting your agent or editor for the first time. Bring them something. I, I like to bring them something from um, from home. Sometimes uh, I've brought them, you know, homemade lemon squares, you know, that you know that that we make here, and uh, um, or just some, you know, something little. It doesn't have to be big. It goes a long way. Uh, and yeah, the the more personal connection you make, the more you're going to stand out from their list of. 50 other clients, you know, sometimes these agents will have 30 other writers that they're dealing with. What, what, what's going to make them remember you? Um, yeah. So that's, that's pretty much the, the big picture. Um, I highly recommend, and this was in like a recommended, you know, reading or viewing. Uh, if you haven't watched it already, uh, there's a woman named Alyssa Matisic on YouTube. I'm going to type her name out here. Um, and she does an excellent, uh, she has an excellent YouTube channel that goes through um, all the inside baseball stuff and uh, from the publishing industry. And she was an agent. In fact, she was a young agent working for Julie Bearer, my first agent in her agency. So um, like I said, at that level, it's such a small world. Everybody knows each other. But Alyssa, uh, you know, came up through my agent. She really knows what she's talking about. And um, she's spilling a lot of secrets of the publishing industry. So check check her channel out. Uh, any questions?